bundles of wheat, right? It's the it's the harvest. It's the harvest, and that's what that song's about. Is is uh, is celebrating that that harvest, and of course, it's what it's talking about is the harvest of the harvest of souls as people come to Christ. And we've had a we've had a great weekend uh, focused on that as we've uh, uh, been with uh, David and Gloria and Levy, and uh, um, they've been teaching us how to think more productively about uh, the kind of soils that those seeds are planted in, and then watered in, and then ends up bringing um, bringing in the harvest in the end. <laughs> right, right. Yep. Well, it just got, you know, it got dawned on me as we were singing that song. Uh, that song was written more back in an agricultural society. And so if you sang that song there, um, everybody knew what sheaves were. But I thought, you know what, of our younger generations, how many people or even my generation, how many of us really know what sheaves are? Now we know what it's talking about, the harvest, but, but a sheave itself, is that a sheave of wheat or is it a sheave of what, what is it of? And the reason I was thinking about that, I think, is that was one of the things that we talked about over this weekend, is how, you know, it used to be in the 1950s in America, um, it used to be that when you talked about things of the gospel, there was a common knowledge that was throughout our society which is less and less today. You know, I remember when we lived in Seattle years ago, we were going door to door, inviting people to church and trying to share the gospel with them. And the, an Oriental man opened the door uh, to his apartment and I began to uh, try to witness to him. I invited him to church, um, asked him some things about his own spiritual beliefs. And he was just kind of looking at me, kind of glazed over. And so I tried to share the gospel with him. I said, we're here talking about Jesus Christ. And I started to begin to share the gospel. And I noticed that he was just looking very blank. And I was like, oh, well, you've, you know about Jesus, right? You know who Jesus is? No. Uh, okay, then I need to go back before that. Um, Adam and Eve, you know who Adam and Eve are? No. Okay, um, well, have a good evening. <laughs> you know, I, did, I didn't know what to do with it. You know, I was, I was shocked. I went back to the, to the church to other people that were doing the same thing I was. And I said, I can't believe it. In the United States of America, I met a man that had never heard the name of Jesus Christ. Or Adam and Eve. I didn't, I didn't know what to do with it. And that, you know, sadly, increasingly in our society, we've got to deal more and more back at that level uh, we can't deal with the common knowledge that, that used to be here at the time. <clears throat> you know, back in the 50s, there was still had prayer and, and scriptures in the public schools. So, so uh, that was, you had a very easy starting point. But, um, but maybe not necessarily that, did that mean a, an easier job. And so anyway, we've had a great time this week with the levies and uh, going through these things. And they're going to be sharing their ministry and, and the word of God with us here this morning. We're excited to have them. Uh, a couple things to take care of before that. Del, why don't you come with our morning announcements? Good morning, everyone. You know, when I was a kid, I used to sing that, bringing in the sheep. Well, the, sh <laughs> <laughs> the sheep are here this morning, so great. <laughs> Good to see you. Several announcements. Number one, this is a proof copy of the Little Fork Baptist Church directory. As a family, pick one up, look it over. If you'd like your email address, put it in there, etc. Put it in there and give it to Robin so she can print up the, not the proof copy, but the final copy. <clears throat> Also, Northern Options is having a baby shower. That's this Saturday, October 2nd at 1030. And it's hosted by the First Baptist Church in International Falls. You're all invited. Brunch will be served. There will be games, fun, fellowship. I shouldn't say you're all invited. Women are invited. All right. Vicki and Becky are speaking about what's been happening at Options. And certainly we support that. And to bring a gift, consider bringing diapers, wipes, outfits, funding. Uh, bring a friend as well. So keep that in mind this Saturday at 1030 at First Baptist Church. 
Wednesday, we're back to our normal schedule. 6.30, we have the adult Bible study. I encourage you to be there for it. We'll be talking about the seven trials of, or seven trials, six trials of Jesus. And we'll be looking at the 18 rules and regulations that were overlooked when they had these trials. Also at seven o'clock is lift for our young people. And Thursday at 1.30 is ladies Bible study at the Kathy Lee home. I also see here a sign up for the harvest dinner and that's coming up really quick, October 9th. I'm gonna pass this around so you can sign it. I'll start on this side, when it gets to the back, we'll bring it up and then I'll bring it back down. Thank you. That Northern Oxford for Women is a good, is a good ministry there for sure and we support in fact our church recently in the last event supported that ministry to the tune of a thousand dollars and sponsored the, the last event if you have any questions on any of their uh, programs and things probably the best thing to do is Kaylin Huffnagel is our contact with that our most direct contact with that ministry so if uh, we in our announcements if you have questions about things that weren't clear to you or whatever she would be the best person for you to talk to um, when you be aware of that <clears throat> Okay, um, let's go ahead and spend some time in prayer together. We need to be praying, as we have been for a long time, for Mary Keep. Uh, Mary uh, got some news the other, the other day that, uh, that things did not look good for her. And so she basically kind of came home to spend her last days with her family and uh, out on their property and be with their kids and grandkids. And she had come home and did spend some time with her kids and grandkids. Um, got a, a, a little more information and felt like there was maybe still a, a still a chance, still some hope, and so they got the ball rolling and got her back down to Mayo and got a feeding tube in to try to get her some nourishment and some strengthening to be able to do some more chemo to be able to try to fight against that cancer one more time, and so uh, um, that's where they are. That's where they are now. They're they're in a in a struggle. She's fighting for her life, and. Um, uh, and she is a fighter. I spent a couple hours with her the other day, and and uh, when she was kind of at the point where she was kind of making the decision about whether to stay here and or or to head back down, and and she is definitely determined to to, to fight as long as as long as she can. But really, be praying for it's a tough time for her for Larry. Larry is just uh, he's hovering over her around her, doing everything that he can to help his wife and. Uh, um, we just, uh, they're very thankful for our prayer support, and, and I assured them that they absolutely have it. So let's be, be praying for, uh, be praying especially for Mary and Larry here this morning. All right, let's spend some time in prayer together. Our Father, we're thankful. We're thankful that when we come together in the name of Jesus Christ, that you hear us. In fact, you've promised that anywhere, even just two or more are gathered in your name that you hear. And, and Lord, we know that it's not because of our own accomplishments or, our, or anything produced by ourselves, but it's just by the simple fact that Jesus Christ is our high priest. He's the one that, that offered up the sacrifice of himself for our sins before you, and he is the one that brings us to God. And so, uh, God, and it's, in the, it's in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we come before you this morning and just thankful that you hear us. Father, we do pray for, for Mary this morning. We pray that you'd be working within her body, that you would be working uh, within her heart as well. And, and um, Lord, it's, it's still our desires. We would still pray for a miraculous healing, that you would heal her. We don't know all the ins and outs of your will, but that is, that is our desire and our, and our primary request. We're submitting to the will of God, but we're uh, eager to see her delivered from this thing. So, Father, we just uh, hold her up before you. We also think of Larry and all that he's going through with her, and, and we just pray that you would be at work in, in both of their hearts, drawing them to yourself, helping them to feel and experience your comfort and your encouragement through this. We pray for their uh, family as they, as they gather around and as they're going through this as well. We pray also that they would be comforted, also that they would be drawn to you. Father, we pray... For the, for the good of these people and also for the glory of God in, in this event, in, this, in these circumstances. Father, Father, I also think of, of Carolyn Sahid who's waiting for a liver and a kidney and, 
And uh, we just pray that you would keep her um, stable and healthy until that time. Thank you for things like this uh, angel flight that is ready at a moment's notice as soon as they have any of those things to fly her to where she needs to be to get the, that transplant. And uh, God, again, in, in these things, we, we thank you for the technology. We thank you for the doctors and the medical care, but we, but we trust in you. And so we pray that you be at work in, in her life and in Sam's life as well. Father, I think of Bonnie Siltman as she's in her last days here and on hospice. We pray that you'd be with, with her. I think of uh, Doug Trapp's uh, grandkids with, as they um, have this very rare neurological disease. And we just pray for some breakthrough there or some healing there. And um, Father, I also pray for Gabe. I thank you for Gabe and his willingness to, to put himself in, in potentially harm's way to protect our nation as he's uh, entered the military in the last year or so. And uh, Father, I know they're, they're talking about moving him in, the, oh, in March or so to, to Australia and, and wherever they ship him, Lord. We, we just pray for his safety and we thank you for him and other people like him. And we know it's through their uh, ability to take risks that we continue to enjoy the freedoms that we have in this nation. We do pray for our nation's leaders that you'd give wisdom as they handle foreign affairs and domestic affairs both. Father, we pray <clears throat> that you'd uh, watch over our nation, that you'd be working in the hearts of the people within our nation, that, that, that our nation might be seen as, even as the nation of Israel looked to Jesus uh, back in the time, and the Samaritans as they looked, as, a, as the harvest field looked ripe and ready to be harvested. Father, we pray that our nation would be seen the same way and we see lots of people come to know Christ as their Savior. But Father, we uh, thank you for the levies and their ministry. We pray for your blessing upon their ministry as they strive to help churches and pastors to uh, be focused upon the Great Commission and uh, very practical ways to help carry that out in effective ways. So we pray that you'd help us to be engaged here this morning as we uh, consider their, look at their ministry and hear from you and your word. It's in Jesus' name that we pray these things. Amen. All right, at this time I'm going to have uh, David and Glorianne come up and I'll let them introduce themselves to you. Many of you already know them from this weekend's events, but uh, I'll tell you, it has been a thrill. We took them, uh, we took them thought while they're here, should get to see some sights. So we said, you know what, we're going to take you up to the lake. We're going to have dinner at Island View, a resort on the lake. And we got up there and we walked up to Island View. It was kind of noisy up on the back deck and stepped up there. And it looked busy. They had games going on and throwing beanbags or something and all kinds of things. And we thought that was a little bit weird. Stepped up there and they said, we got greeted with, sorry, we're closed for the season. I think they were having a company picnic or something. So we said, oh, all right. Well, we stepped down off the deck and kind of looked out over the lake for a moment. Let's go to Shay Shay's. Drove up there to read a sign on the door. Sorry, closed for the season. <laughs> so, at any rate, we, got, we walked around there and looked at the lake. So we got a few different views of the lake. And that, was, and that was very enjoyable. It was a beautiful evening. And ended up back in town having dinner at Chocolate Moose. <laughs> but but uh, even more than that, it gave us a great uh, time of fellowship. We have you know, Weinbergs who are like family to us or are also pretty much like family to them. So we have some real connecting points and it was just a great, uh, it was great encouragement and time of fellowship for Lisa and I. To, we've thoroughly enjoyed uh, their visit with us in, in so many different ways. And so I'm glad to welcome them here this morning. So. Well, good morning. Again, I'm David, Gloria Ann. Just make sure we're clarifying that for you. <laughs> um, so, let me see. I got the, is this on, Greg? Yeah, it should be good. I'm not sure what I'm pushing. Hit the bottom button. Ha <laughs> ha, there we are. Yeah, that looks like us. That is a picture <laughs> of, our, of our family and um, so we are uh, missionaries with ABWE, and, and we'll talk a little bit about what that is. Um, 
And the Lord has just brought us together from some very, very different backgrounds. I'll just briefly share my story of how I came to faith in Christ. Those of you who got to hear yesterday got to hear that full, that fuller story. But I was brought up in a Jewish home. And uh, my parents got divorced when I was about nine years old. And um, lived with my mom and then with my dad. And... Uh, then while living with my dad, things were not going well, and so ended up moving out, living with an aunt and uncle who were Christians, and heard the gospel, went to a Christian school. So I was a Jewish boy going to Christian school my senior year, heard the gospel, second day, and the Lord worked in my heart, trusted Jesus Christ as my Savior. I love Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And God did a radical change in my life. Lots of neat things that God has done, is doing, and I know will continue to do to helping me become more and more like Christ. I, unlike Dave, had a rich heritage of um, Christian believers in my family. Um, just a sweet background. I've got an uncle and several cousins that are missionaries in Brazil. I have, in fact, um, I think I meant, forgot to mention Surrettes, um have connection with my uncle, which is kind of a fun story, the threats that are serving in Brazil, and an uncle that's a, a retired pastor. And so raised in a Christian home, in church all the time. But I came to that point when I was about eight years old that I, I was wrestling with that, knowing that my family was a Christian, but I felt like I needed to do something. And I kind of came to the end of the I'm a good kid thing and talk to my Sunday school teacher and ask her to show me from the Word of God how I could personally put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ. So Ephesians 2, 8, 9 are my verses that I cling to, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And I needed that for me. It wasn't anything that I could do. It wasn't my good works, but I needed to place my whole entire faith and trust in the person and work of Jesus Christ. So how did we meet? So after I trusted Christ as my Savior, went through that, finished up, graduated, and actually um, my dad came to my graduation, and that was the time actually I told him that I had become a Christian. So just I had put my trust in Christ, and my, my dad was, uh, it was okay with that. I think he thought, well, it's a passing thing, 17-year-old making some decision of some kind, crazy decision. But... Um, I was trying to think what was the next steps. My dad wanted me, I enjoyed math, and so he wanted me to go to, you know, to a public university and become an engineer. And so I signed up at a local college for that, and I went back to go help my aunt and uncle. So this is in Michigan, um, and my dad, li we lived in a little town called Davisburg, Michigan, which was interesting. A couple weeks ago, I was back in that area. I got to go to the very house that I lived in, and I was, I was like driving up and down the road and kind of slowly stopping by, try to stop and take a picture. The guy noticed me while I was out there, and, but I drove away, and then it was like the Lord pressing on me, why don't you go back? And so I went back, pulled in the driveway, and he's right there. And I said, I used to live in this house. And uh, he just welcomed me, let me go through the house, and we walked through it. I got to walk through it and everything. So it was really, it was really uh, a cool opportunity. But we lived there in Davisburg. My aunt and uncle lived in Ypsilanti. And after I trusted Christ, God did a work in them, and they wanted to get back into Christian ministry. And he was working at GM at the time. And so they went to go work at a Christian company called Graco. I don't know if any of you have heard of Graco. It has a Christian background to it, baby products and things like that. So they moved to Canada. So I went back to help them move. And when I went to go help them move, phone call came from this lady. Uh, at the, it was a small Bible college connected with the church that I had a scholarship to go to that college. Well, I knew that's exactly what God wanted me to do. And uh, so I had to go home and tell my dad, Dad, I know what God wants me to do, to go to this Bible college. Well, that's when it became a real tension point with my dad. And make the long story short, I made, already made this longer than I normally do, but uh, he kicked me out of the house. So I packed up all my stuff and I moved next door 
I had another aunt and uncle that lived next door. And uh, lived with them for the summer before going to that small Bible college. I was there for one year. And then um, my aunt and uncle came back from Canada and went up to a small, to, to interview for a small Bible, at a small Bible college called Northland Baptist Bible College. I don't know if any of you have heard of that. It's up in northern Wisconsin. And so I went up there to go visit this school. And when I went up, yes, I am going to tell that story. Uh, so when I, so uh, there was a guy showing me around the campus, and we sat down at the uh, meal, and he prayed with his girlfriend. And I just thought, man, if I can get a girl like that, I'll be doing really good. Well, that girl was Glorianne. He made a bad mistake in letting her go. Dumped and, me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we... We met there, but it's a small Bible college, so if you just like talk to somebody for like two minutes, you're instantly a dating couple. And, uh, but, <laughs> but our junior year, uh, the Lord brought us together, and, uh, and we, got, we got married December 31st, 1988. And, uh, and then we went into, into ministry. And uh, the Lord allowed us to have 10 years of pastoral ministry, and then went to seminary at Central Baptist Theological Seminary, and then 14 more years of pastoral ministry before joining up in ABWE in 2019. But I'll let Glorianne kind of uh, explain about our family that you can see up there. Yes. We have four children. Our oldest daughter is Alyssa. I'll point them out here in a second. Alyssa, and then our second daughter is Abby, and our son David, and our youngest is Anne. So if you go from left to right, um, the gentleman on the end, Joshua and Alyssa, that's our daughter and her husband. They are at Lighthouse Baptist Church in Invergrove Heights. Um, and Cottage then, Grove. I'm sorry, Cottage Grove. They live, they live in, in Invergrove Heights. Uh, the gentleman in purple is our son. He's our third child. His name is David, um, as is Dave. And he is working for a company called Aldi, a grocery store. And he, we say he does his, um, his job to pay for his ministry as he works with the church in a, in a youth program. And he really loves that. And then Dave and I in the middle. And then our, the next girl in the white is our youngest daughter, Anne, and she lives with us in Pennsylvania, and she's working on a degree in nursing. And then the next two are Abby and her husband, David. Yes, David, David, and David. It's great fun at our house. So I try to call him Dave and call our son David and call David, David. And, um, and it's great. Some, somebody goes, um, David, would you like to pray for the meal? <laughs> That's my favorite to do. And they all look at me like, who? Um, and our son-in-law, David, is holding our, our only grand, well, mm -hmm. we can't tell that, but our grandbaby, um, <laughs> Emma. And uh, she will Somebody be else is expecting. You're not supposed to tell. Okay. We're not I didn't tell. Yet. I didn't tell. <laughs> well, just by... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, good. All right. So back to Emma. Emma turns two in, um, in October, and David is working. Our son-in-law, David, is working on his Ph.D. in Egyptology in Memphis, Tennessee. So, um, so we've got Minnesota, Tennessee... And then our other two, our son David and, and Anne, live in Pennsylvania. So we are just so thankful for them, and we are just blessed uh, to be their parents and just to see how God is going to direct them. And we were chatting with your, you know, it's, it's fun to be parents of small children. It's a, it's a unique journey to be parents of adult children, but we are just blessed and we are so thankful for them. Yeah, so the ministry that God has given us with ABWE is in the what's called good soil evangelism and discipleship. Let me see if we, and uh, you'd say, well, what is good soil evangelism and discipleship? We talked about a little bit this morning about the parable of the soils, but good soil evangelism and discipleship is a careful attempt to assure that people to whom we minister clearly understand the gospel. They genuinely embrace the gospel and firmly hold on to the gospel. And so we go around, and, uh, and I'll let Gloria tell kind of what our big picture is, but we, we go around to churches like we did uh, Friday and Saturday and do trainings, as well as doing trainings at our home office 
Um, and then we come alongside of pastors and just to try to be an encouragement, being about the Great Commission. But Gloria, why don't you tell kind of in a short sentence, what is our ministry kind of all about? Can I front load it? You. Okay. You know what? It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, I want to say personally before we get further, how much we've enjoyed being with you. Um, it has just been a joy to be with you. It's fun when you, I mean, I'll, I'll admit it's scary coming because you're like, okay, these people are strangers, but it's really fun to look out and say, okay, you know what? We now have friends in Little Fork, Minnesota. And um, so we come as strangers and, and hopefully we leave as friends. But if I could say, when God called us into this new ministry, um, I wasn't exactly ready to go. I, I loved the, I, first of all, when we moved into our last house, I was like, this, it, I mean, it wasn't extravagant, but it was, it was the house of my dreams. And um, in fact, I told my friend, every time I get my flowers, just where I like them, we have to move. And my friend said, let me know when you're planning on moving and I'll destroy your flower beds. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so this is where we were, and our kids were, you know, relatively close to us. And the Lord began to um, began to move us in a different direction. And and I'll say, when He finally, when I finally got the message, Glorianne, I I think the Lord is moving us on into missions. Um, I wasn't exactly thrilled. I always had a heart for missions. Like I said, my parents, you know, missions was always before us. Our family had missions in it. I would watch slideshows and be like, oh, you know, I praise the Lord. These people are going to that country, especially children. And then I go, shoo, but it's not me. <laughs> and uh, so as we began to move into this and the Lord began to draw my heart, uh, we did some training uh, to prepare for, you know, doing our presentation. And our coach said to us, or uh, the coaching team said, be ready to be, uh, be comfortable being uncomfortable. And I was like, I don't think I like that at this age of my life. And yet, you know what? God has pushed us and grown us and stretched us. And we are so thankful to be, I am so thankful to be in this and be able to, to go and do. And this is what our, our statement that we try to tell people, if you were to say, what are you doing? We would say, we, we are looking for people like you to partner with us as we strive to ignite pastors and churches across America in fulfilling the Great Commission. In your local community, we're right where you are. We want to see churches and pastors say, we have got to get back to the evangelistic model of the Great Commission. And then with a global impact. Because, you know, two ways with that. One, the world is coming to us. You know, we've got, we've got nationalities that are coming to us. And then the other is our, our Bible colleges are diminishing. And, um, and we don't have those training centers that we used to have. And so our church is the key to the, our local churches. And then with a global impact, that it will impact the rest of the world. And so we are passionate about what we are doing. And we are thrilled to be with you and hope that God will ignite Little Fork, Minnesota, to be salt and light in this area with, here and then with a global impact. So little <clears throat> nuts and bolts about what we do. So ABWE. I know some of you are familiar, a few of you are familiar with ABWE. So it, ABWE stands for Association of Baptist for World Evangelism. So just a brief little history about them. They started in 1927 under the direction of Dr. Raphael Thomas. He was a medical missionary with a different mission agency at that time in the Philippines. And in time, he was... Um, he was witnessing to patients as he was talking through, and the agency that he was with said, you know, we just want you to focus in on the medical and not so much on the spiritual. And after repeated appeals, he just said, I can't do that anymore. And so he resigned from that mission, and he and some colleagues started a new mission to take the gospel to the Orient. By 1939, so 12 years later, the gospel is not only going to the Philippines, but it was starting to spread. And so they changed the name from Association of Baptist uh, for the Orient to Association of Baptist for World Evangelism. And we love ABWE's mission, which is to fulfill the Great Commission by multiplying leaders, churches, and missions movements among every people. And we specifically, as I mentioned earlier, focusing it on training. So we go around and do training. So uh, Pastor Greg, I think, was asking me about that. I think right now we're about 
traveling maybe a quarter of the year and it, it we we just do it in pockets like right now we're on a four week ministry trip and uh, going to be at i think it's five different churches and and at uh at faith baptist bible college we've gone out on a six week trip actually the four week is better than the six week <laughs> six weeks being it's a long time away from home but we love the opportunity to get to to know to know and to meet people and to do the trainings and to spend time with people and have people wrestle through and we love to hear stories about what god is doing and and we get to hear some of those stories about um, some of the people taking the story of hope working it through for themselves and then starting a, a bible study with a neighbor and we have some of those some of those great stories but you know how do we get introduced to it maybe you want to share that story how well we got... it's it's really kind of a neat story um Actually, a missionary that you have on your board, Phil DeMart, uh, he, his mission agency required him to go to ABWE and take the good soil training. And he said to Dave, he's like, hey, you know, pastor, I'm heading out there to do that. And Dave said, oh, I think I'd like to go with you. And if I could say, really, he went as a skeptic, you know, like, what are they teaching you? You know, this, you are part of us, a missionary, and so I'd like to know what they are teaching you. So he went. And actually, our, our son, David, went with him, and he took the training. And I can remember him coming home, and he said, this is good material. I really like you know, their approach. I like what they're doing. And like most of us who go to a great conference, we say, that was great. And we put it on the shelf, and we let it collect dust until we dust again. Well, the Lord prompted him to take it off of the shelf. And he said, you know what? There's 40 events, 10, 20 Old Testament 20 New Testament. I'm just going to do one a day for my devotion. So you think that's just a little bit over a month. And he did that. And he began to pray that the Lord would give us somebody that we could share the story of hope with. And if I could challenge you, especially those of you who were here yesterday, let me challenge you. Do that. Do your devotions. Just go through the story of hope, one event a day, and then begin to ask God, God, who could you give to me that I could ask them if they would like to go through this? So it's a great challenge. So God, God honored that prayer and answered that prayer by sending us a young couple, and it was the McCuskers. And this is before the two little ones were born. Um, it was really interesting. They came to visit Grace, filled out a bit, uh, the car, dropped it in the plate Monday. You know, Dave's going through this stuff. And he read it, and they checked on there. We, uh, well, first of all, they were coming because they were expecting Lizzie, their daughter, and um, they, they thought, you know what, we're going to start our family. We probably need to, you know, do the church thing. So on there, they checked, we're interested in a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Woohoo! <laughs> we were like, yes. I mean, that God dropped them in our lap. So we took them out to lunch the next uh, Sunday. They came back again and just said, hey, tell us about yourself. And we found out Kevin was a car mechanic. And Heidi was working at that time as a bank, as a teller at a bank, and um, just you know again began to peel their worldview onion, ask things about their spiritual background. And Kevin was raised in a Catholic home. Heidi was raised in a church very similar to our church, and about age 17, kind of said, "I'm done with church," and walked away from it. So Dave said to them, hey, you know what? Would you be interested in doing this Bible study, you know, doing the story of hope? And they said, sure. So we began to meet with them on Tuesday nights to go to their house. I always had a cup of tea, and we started through doing the story of hope with them. And it was so exciting. We learned quickly. Heidi was a believer, but had, again, walked away. But Kevin was not. And as we would do these events, I think my favorite, absolutely favorite thing, was the bottom banner. So this shows the two events. This is one and then the second one. We'd read the scripture, ask the questions. And then at the end of the night, the banner at the very bottom talks about the character of God. And we'd say, you know, pick some of the things that just popped out of the scripture that you could say described who God was. So maybe in this one, it was the almighty creator or the eternal being. And, and to hear Kevin, an unbeliever, defend the character of God, it was absolutely amazing. We were so thrilled. And so it took us a while to get through, and as we were anticipating Lizzie to come and join us in our Bible study, which she did, and I got to practice grandma arms while um, we were doing our Bible study, we were also anticipating Kevin's new birth. 
And we went through the Bible study and then did the wrap it up, which is called the Chrono Bridge, where key statements about who God is and man, sin, death, Christ, cross, faith, and life. And Kevin trusted Christ. He became a new creature. And we, we were excited several months later, Kevin was baptized and they joined the church. They've since moved to another church, but they were what sent us on our journey with um, Good Soil. And we're so thankful for Kevin and Heidi and how God used them to ignite in us a desire to see that other people like them want to know how to come to Christ. So even going back to that, you know, reading this morning in John chapter four that the fields are white already to harvest. So it was not only Kevin and Heidi uh, that God sent, but Jerry and Sarah was another couple and we made reference to them. Jerry had worked with Bird's Eye and, you know, we started the study together and then there was like a delay of four months and then the Lord was working in Jerry and they wanted to continue to meet. And then we introduced you to the Nelson family and how that the Nelsons, uh, coming from a Methodist background, but just interested. What's the difference between Methodist and Baptist? They asked that question. I said, well, rather than answering that question, would you be interested in studying what the Bible's all about? And Phil, start, Phil DeMart started this study with them, and then we continued, and, and they trusted. We think that they really were genuine believers, but then uh, followed in believers' baptism as well. And you well, want to tell this other? Yeah. What was fun was the mother, Andrea, while we were doing this study, would go back to work and just say, hey, this is what we studied about. And then a look, after we'd finished the study, it was actually some time, this coworker came to her and she said, you keep talking, you were talking about that study. And she said, hey, Liz, why don't you come and we'll do the study? So Andrea, you know, relatively uh, new in understanding about her faith, then, and it was really funny, she goes, I, can I have a fun, you know, I'll do the study with you as long as I can do phone a friend. And so I think Diane Weinberg actually was her phone a friend if she, you know, got questions. And so Andrea did the story of hope with Liz and Liz placed her faith and trust in Jesus Christ and Liz was baptized and is now, has now joined Grace Baptist Church. So it wasn't just a disciple. If I can encourage you, don't think stop with one person. Think about a disciple maker. You duplicate yourself in somebody else and then that person becomes a disciple maker. This one, this just thrilled our hearts when we got to meet Liz um, at Christmas time. So it was just such an exciting um, story for us. And just backing up here, and I mentioned this yesterday, uh, on the end is Hannah. So it's, uh, it's Wade and then it's Haley, and then Andrea, and then Hannah. And Hannah emailed me, um, that's a month ago or so, and she says, I believe God wants me to be a missionary. And what a cool, what a cool thing. So she's actually coming out, they're coming out to Pennsylvania end of uh, October, and we have what's called 24-hour demo. So you get 24 hours exposed to what ABWE and what missions is all about. And so, so uh, Hannah and her mom, Andrea, are coming out and we're just thrilled. And this is what we, what we want to be a part of. We want to be a part of disciples who are making disciples, disciple makers. And our burden really is, um, I guess. Oh, and you, you can, anytime you want to come stay with us, just look us up. We live in Pennsylvania. We're 30 minutes from Hershey, or Hershey. We're 30 minutes from Gettysburg. We're three hours from DC. If you really want to go to New York, we're like three hours from New York. So. Let us know. We have a guest room. So our burden is, as we, as as I mentioned, you know, even with churches here in America, I don't know if some stats just to throw out to you, you know, four thousand churches get planted every year, thirty seven hundred churches get closed every year, and many churches that remain alive and functioning are about ready to close. And, and many churches, they're on survival mode, and so they're not thinking about reaching out into their community. They're not thinking about seeing that the gospel spreads around the world. And we think, how do we ever get here? Actually, we got missionaries coming from other countries to our country. And uh, how did this happen? Well, just opposing a little scenario for you to think about. Uh, he's a pastor, and he's gone to Bible college and maybe seminary, and loves the Lord, loves the Word, and he wants to be a part of evangelism, discipleship, leadership, development. And so he starts at his first church, and he is all excited. He's prepping for sermons. He's, 
he's answering emails, he's visiting people at the hospital, he's got committee meetings, and, and he's got lots of stuff going on, and uh, he finds out as time goes on, I got no time for evangelism, discipleship, leadership development. Well, they have a missionary coming to visit uh, on furlough that their church supports, and the missionary is sharing about what God is doing on the field. And uh, they're building redemptive relationships with unbelievers. They're getting to know them and, and having some conversations about the Lord. And they're even, the Lord is even opening up opportunities for them to do Bible studies with people. And they're seeing some people come to faith in Christ. And as they're starting a, a church, they're already talking about the next one that they want to plant. There's actually a guy uh, that has, as it were, retired from being on the field. And he was a part of 17 church plants in Peru. I think it's Peru. Oh, Colombia. Colombia. And, and how they did it was whatever one that they were planting, they're always talking about the next one they're going to plant. So it was all part of their DNA. And uh, so you think about this pastor. He's hearing what God is doing on the field, and he's so excited. Praise the Lord about what God is doing there. And then he starts thinking about his own situation, and he gets a little cynical, and he says, well... That's what missionaries do. But here in the States, it's so much different. And the missionary pulls out Matthew 28, and he says, go and make disciples. This was not written just for missionaries. This was written for us here in the, in the States. And the pastor has to wrestle with that and has to admit, he's right. This is what we need to be about as well. So the pastor starts praying and thinking and chatting with his people and the people realize, you're right. We need to be about the Great Commission as well. So in this little scenario that I've just created for you, it's going in the right direction. But how many other pastors are out there that need a trusted friend that's willing to say, hey, I know you're busy, lots of stuff going on, but you need to make sure that evangelism, discipleship, leadership development stay as a priority. Lord willing, that's what we are doing and what we want to continue to do. We have lots of opportunities coming alongside of pastors and churches, and we're just wanting to be an encouragement. We can be a shot in the arm, a plug, and say, not only do you need to do it, but here's some tools in providing the tools to be able to help encourage people to do that. So we're looking for partners uh, in doing this, this ministry, uh, that, doing this ministry that the Lord has entrusted to us. I know it sounds more cumbersome, sometimes easy to say, the, the minist my ministry. It's not my ministry. It is a ministry that God has entrusted to us. And we want to be faithful stewards with that. And so we are looking for churches and individuals that would say, I would like to, I'd like to partner with you, whether it's prayerfully partner with us, uh, financially partner with us, or be a networker. And what do I mean by a networker? Well, could be, you know what? I know another church that would love to, uh, to get some training like that. Or I know a pastor that would love to get some training like that. Or, you know what? I know somebody who would love to partner with a missionary. And, or I need some help myself. And I would love for somebody to come alongside with me. So that's kind of the networking idea. But if that's an interest for you, I can't remember if we have little cards on our table. Um, where it's like a little blue card and it says, I would like to know more. You just put your name, email, phone number, and we'd love to connect with you and find out how you would like to potentially uh, partner with us. If anything we say today kind of resonates with you, we'd love that. That partnership idea concept is not originating with us, but in Philippians, it talks about where Paul thanked the Philippians in chapter 1, verse 5. He thanked them for their fellowship in the gospel. That word fellowship is koinonia, it's a Greek word. And it can be translated partnership. It means a commitment to a shared vision. So Paul was thanking the Philippian church who joined up with him. And then at the end of the book in chapter 4, in verse 17, he said there was fruit that was going to be bound to their account. And what did that mean? It didn't mean they were going to get brownie points in heaven. It meant that wherever Paul went and he shared the gospel with people and they trusted Christ or churches were planted, that church got to be a part of that. And so, so if, if, uh, if what we say connects with you and you'd love to be a part of that, we would love that um, as well. So that's, our, that's the ministry 
that God has given to us. So I have a little handout for you. I'll take just a few moments. I want to look at Matthew 28 with you. Um, Jesus' Great Commission. And I love the Great Commission and spend time thinking about that. So does everybody have one of those little handouts? At the top it says Jesus' Great Commission. So here's my, here's my key idea that I want to want you to think about and be challenged with this morning as we think about the Great Commission is that believers in Jesus Christ ought to actively participate in fulfilling the Great Commission. Believers in Jesus Christ ought to actively participate in fulfilling the Great Commission. So here's a picture of our house. It's maybe hard to really get the, get the feel here, but um, Minnesota is a, well, we did see some hills yesterday, uh, kind of driving around in here. But where we lived in Owatonna, very, very flat. And where we live in Edders, Pennsylvania, it is like this. And our, and our, uh, our uh, street address is Winding Hill and is very, very fitting. It is like this and it is like this. And so actually our driveway, we're trying to give this feel, but our driveway is like way, way down and you got to climb up. So it's like, it's almost like a, it's a cardio just to go down to get the mail. <laughs> So, um, so that is our that is our house, and um, we moved there uh, just over two. Well, just right around two years ago, and um, so at some point we would love to to build uh, a storage shed, and we got a two car garage. It's kind of cut in half right there, so we just have one car right now. Um, but our daughter is with us and she has her car, so it'd be great if her car and our, and our car went in. So we thought storage shed we could put in the back. So let's, we're gonna play pretend here for a moment. Let's say you're an excellent shed builder. And it uh, doesn't matter, doesn't matter your age and it doesn't matter your gender. You're an excellent shed builder, okay? You have that skill, I've just given it to you. Uh, at least for this illustration. And, um, and so you come over our house and you ask us a series of questions. You know, how big do you want it? Uh, do you want windows? Do you want a ramp? Do you want power? Do you want shelving? Yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have that in my notes that you're speaking up there. <laughs> Siding. So anyway, so a myriad of questions you have. Been, and then you go home and you design it. And you come back with an estimate and you bring us the estimate and we go back and forth and we agree to it. And we sign it, we shake on it, and we authorize you to build our shed. We authorize you to build the shed of our dreams. And, um, and so your mission is to build our shed or your commission um, is to build what we have wanted and you are to do what we want to fulfill our plans so if i could say in a much grander and greater way god has given a mission to churches and to individuals and it's not about building sheds it's about fulfilling jesus great commission i don't have time to talk about this or this but I'll just throw it up there about what discipleship is about. But I'd like us to look at these passages. So when we think about the Great Commission, many times we focus in on Matthew 28. And I want to, to look at that with you. Matthew 28, and, uh, and starting in verse 18, you have it on your sheet or you can open up your scriptures either, either way. Uh, this is in the New King James. It says, And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now, in the Great Commission, there is one command. 
Now, a command means it's a, an implied you. So it's a, looks like just a, a verb. And that one command is to make disciples. It found in verse 19. Now he said, well, go looks like a command as well. It does, but it's not. And I'll explain that in just a little bit. But make disciples. And the idea of making disciples, the, the force of the verb means it's to characterize all of your life. So a believer's life and a church's life should be all about making disciples. So what does that mean to make disciples? It is the idea of an apprentice. Um, so I know Pastor Greg is in construction. And let's say we were up here and, um, and I wanted to learn about construction. And he would say, Dave, why don't you come alongside with me? And uh, you need a tool belt and you need to get some tools. But I'm not going to let you use those tools yet. I want you to watch me first. You make me nervous when I see you carrying that hammer. <laughs> So, so I'm watching and I'm observing how Pastor Greg does construction, and I'm learning. And, they, and then he says to me, okay, I think I'm ready for you to let me, you can hand me a nail. And then I think, okay, I, so then as time goes on, I'm learning more and more from him, and then eventually we're now working side by side. And he's showing me, and I'm learning more, and I'm asking questions, and he's teaching me. And then, then he starts to let me lead some more. And now he's kind of coaching me in that process. And then eventually I've learned enough and it's like, Dave, I think, I think you can now go on your own. And now I want to encourage you, you go find somebody else to teach them the trade. That is more of the idea of this idea of making disciples. It's like an apprentice. You take somebody and you have them come alongside with you and this is to characterize your life. And you characterize the life of the local church. So that's kind of a picture of what we have up there. Now, when we think of the Great Commission, we think of Matthew 28, but there are other verses, and I have those on there for you, and I want to just read through those verses, and then I'll make comments about them as I, as I walk through my outline. So if you want to look at those, <coughs> excuse me, um, Mark 16, 15. In Mark 16, 15, and he, that is Jesus, said to them, Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. In Luke 24, for those of us that went through the, the stranger on the road to Emmaus, this is that continued conversation as Jesus had with his disciples. And he said, Jesus said to them, Thus it is written, and thus it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day, and that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. In John 4, this is the, the interchange where Jesus with the, the woman at the well. And he says, but the hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such to worship him. John 15, 16, but you did not choose me. But I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain and whatever you ask the Father in my name he may give you. In John 17, and this is Jesus' high priestly prayer and praying to the Father. And he says, and as you, Father, sent me into the world, I also have sent them, the disciples, into the world. And then John 20, in verse 21, is, he, is Jesus speaking some of his last words to his disciples. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And just before Jesus ascended back to heaven in Acts 1, in verse 8, he said to his disciples, But you shall receive power when the Holy Ghost or Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. So when we think about the Great Commission, I'd like you to think about all of those passages together as a collective whole. And this is what the local church ought to be about and what individual Christians within the local church ought to be about. They ought to be about this great commission. So 
on your, on your paper there, we have this, I got two questions, why and how. So why? Why should, so you can flip your, your hand out over, why should believers participate in fulfilling Jesus' great commission? Letter A, first reason, is to submit to the authority of Christ. So on that Matthew 28, in verse 18, when Jesus was speaking to his 11 disciples, he said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So this is, a, this is a, an authority type of issue. So let's say, um, Pastor Greg, I love his truck. Uh, I'm not a big truck guy, but that was kind of fun riding around in the truck. Um, but let's say Pastor Greg, uh, and this is just for the sake of an illustration here, um, was speeding. He's going way beyond the speed limit. And, and I notice it in his white truck. And so I decide I'm going to get into my Toyota Camry, black Toyota Camry, and I'm going to pull him over. I'm going to do a citizen's arrest. Anybody have ever heard of uh, Barney Fife? Okay. Um, and I'm going to do a citizen's arrest. And so I pull him over. Or I pull up behind him. And I flash my lights at him. And he recognizes what's going on. And so he pulls over. And I pull out a piece of paper. And I said, uh, Pastor Greg, I really like you. But you were speeding. And I'm going to give you a ticket. And I write it out. And he says, Dave, I used to like you. <laughs> and then he says, you know what? You have no authority to give me a ticket. I'd say, you know what? You're right. I have no authority to give you a ticket. But let's say Pastor Greg, and again, for the sake of illustration, he's speeding, and one of those vehicles comes behind him that has one of those lights. You know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever seen one? Uh, yeah, I've seen one of those. <laughs> Confession, good for the soul. Um, it wasn't Glorian's fault. <laughs> Um, actually, on our honeymoon, but that's another story. <laughs> um, but if, if that guy comes behind Pastor Greg, and then he pulls out a piece of paper and said, um, Sir, <laughs> I'm going to give you a ticket. That person has every right and every authority to give him a ticket. And I'm going to flip amen. this. Jesus, <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Jesus has every right and authority to tell us what to do as local churches and as individual Christians. He says, all authority has been given unto me. I'm afraid sometimes we live our lives in such a way that we think, Jesus can't tell me how to run my church, my church. Jesus can't tell me how to run my life. Actually, Jesus says, all authority has been given unto me in heaven and on earth. We probably could leave it right there, and that should be enough for us to realize we should be actively a part of the Great Commission. A second reason, as we're looking at these different verses of Scripture, why should believers participate in fulfilling Jesus' Great Commission is to experience the purpose of Christ is to experience the purpose of Christ. If you want to flip your little sheet over, in John 15, 16, so Jesus is, is there with his disciples in this upper room, and he is chatting with them. Some last things he's wanting them to, to know. And he says this. He says, you did not choose me. It's a powerful statement. You did not choose me. I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should remain, and that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give you. Jesus said, I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit. Have you ever thought about why did God save you? If God saved you just so you could go to heaven, then why didn't he take you the moment you trusted Christ? He left you here for a purpose. And Jesus told his disciples, here's your purpose. Go and bear fruit. Part of the Great Commission. This is what we are to be, we are to be about, is, is to be about the purpose that Jesus has for us. 
So what's involved with, with going or with being, um, with this idea of making disciples? So I have, there's three ideas here. We have that word go. So I told you we're going to go back to that word go. So go is actually, and I don't want to lose anybody here, but go is a participle. So make disciples is an imperative or a command. And go is a participle. Typically, participles are translated with an ing. And we have that if, you, if you're looking at um, verse 19, Matthew 28, 19, you have baptizing. That's a, that's a participle. In verse 20, teaching. That's a participle. Well, why is it go? Why isn't it going? Why is it go? Well, it's a very interesting construction uh, in, the, in the Greek where because of how the form of the verb is and where this participle is in the sentence, that it actually has the same force as a command. So in other words, if you're going to make disciples, you got to go. You can't make disciples by sitting in your house, if I could say it that way. You can't make disciples by just sitting in a building. you got to go. So, so that's why many translations, how they translate that is go and make disciples. Because make disciples, that's the command. But if you're going to make disciples, you got to move. It implies movement. Now, I don't know how you are on statistics. Some statistics can kind of just blow you away. And uh, ABWE recently did, a, did a, um, a promo video. And here are some of those statistics that were on that promo video that just really gripped me. Three billion people have never heard the gospel. I don't know what that does for you. That's like, wow. Three billion people. 7,000 people groups remain unreached. So people, different kinds of people groups that nobody has ever shared the, the gospel with them. 488 million Buddhists that are in the world. 1.8 1.8 billion Muslims, 1.2 billion Hindus, 117 billion non-religious people. There's a, there's a guy I listened to, Al Mohler, and Al Mohler talked about there are people that are spiritual, but they don't want to be religious. What does that mean? They want, to be, they want to make up their own kind of form of spirituality, but they don't want to go to any localized church. That's, what he's, that, that, that's that number. 117 billion people. That is this next, this is the generation right now, Gen Z. They want to make up their own kind of spirituality, whether it's now they're talking about in this article I read, tarot cards, uh, horoscope, and I'll take the Bible, but you can interpret it for me. I'm going to interpret it for myself. And I'm making my own kind of spirituality as I go. 117 billion people like that. And God wants us to go to those people. I think there's two people groups that we struggle with. Um, 9-11 wasn't too long ago. I was at a church um, and just making reference to that. The 20-year anniversary of the planes going there in New York. But Muslims... We struggle with Muslims, and we struggle with the LGBTQ plus, what's the other? Two. Two. Uh, there's another addition that's, that's going on. We struggle with these kind of, how do I reach these people? How do I build redemptive relationships with these people? Do I even want to build relationships with these people? And I appreciate ABWE actually has developed some training in reaching these two people groups. If you notice as we're looking at those texts, it was every people group. There are no exceptions. So we can't say, I'm going to reach these people because they're like me. No. We have no exceptions. Every people group. Part of this, of our purpose, is not only going and sharing the good news of Christ and and leading people to trust in Christ. We haven't fulfilled all of the Great Commission because we need to do the next thing, which is seeing them get baptized. And baptized, we're persuading people who have privately trusted in Christ to publicly identify, I am a follower of Jesus Christ. 
But we haven't fulfilled all the Great Commission by proclaiming Christ to people and seeing them trust Christ and seeing them follow in believers' baptism. But we also need to be uh, teaching them. And this word teaching that is found in verse 20 is actually different than the word in the King James it has uh, in verse 19. Go therefore, go ye therefore and teach all nations. If you have a, a King James Bible, you would see that word teach. Well, the word teach or make disciples is a different than the word teaching in verse 20. And that idea of teaching is the idea of impressing upon the mind. So it's like, here's the teachings of Jesus. Here's your disciple that you're working with. There's Greg, he's working with me. I'm his apprentice. And what the disciple maker does is he says, let me encourage you to think like Jesus. Let me encourage you to talk like Jesus. Let me encourage you to act how Jesus has acted. So pressing on their minds and helping them become more and more of what Christ wants them to be. So why should believers participate in fulfilling in Jesus' great commission to submit to the authority of Christ, to experience the purpose of Christ? And uh, the third reason is to promote the worship of God. And this was in that, in that context there in John chapter 4, in the woman at the well, and Jesus is having this conversation with this woman, and the woman was thinking about worship as a place, and Jesus said, no, worship is about a person. And when Jesus introduces that he is the Messiah, it's very interesting. And she believed him. She went on mission. And she went to go reach into her community. And, um, and when you introduce somebody to Christ, as we did with Kevin and Heidi and um, Jerry and Sarah and the Nelson family, when a person comes to Christ, a new worshiper of God has been born. And Revelation is all about all those people coming around and worshiping Jesus. So the reason why we have mission is because there are people that are not worshiping God. And so we have that privilege of, of bringing more worshipers to God. All right, so how can we do this? How can we do this fulfilling the Great Commission? So here's, here's three simple ways which we can do this. We can be number one, or letter A, by praying to God. Uh, Colossians 4 the Apostle Paul encouraged the uh, believers there to be praying for him. He says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains and pray that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. We need to pray that God opens up opportunities and I hope that you'll do that. God, give me opportunities to talk about Jesus, to have a conversation with people, and pray for clarity, that when you speak, that you speak clearly. So how can we participate in fulfilling the Great Commission? By praying and by building with people. Very interesting as you trace Jesus' life, how many times he had individual conversations. Nicodemus, the woman at the well, Zacchaeus, um, rich young ruler. God wants us to build with people. God is the one who does the saving. God is responsible for conversion. We are responsible for contact and to be building with people. And, uh, and God is giving us opportunities in our own neighborhood. I mentioned yesterday that a lot of people in our neighborhood have dogs. And so we're getting to know people by finding out and asking questions about their dogs. And... Um, we don't have a dog. I'm not interested in getting a dog. So if some of you, oh, you need a dog? No, I don't want a dog. Um, I don't want to clean up after a dog and we travel so much. So that's, that's enough. But when we take an interest in somebody's dog, it's very interesting because their dog means so much to them that it does open up doors for having a conversation. And we've had lots of people come by our house and we just stop and we get a chance to chat because we ask about, about their dog. So we're finding out ways to which to connect and to build with people and to build with people over time. And, uh, and encourage you, use your home as a building place. And, and we're grateful for the opportunities that the Lord is giving to us as well. And then the idea of teaching over time. Uh, Pastor Greg mentioned earlier, we live in a biblically illiterate society. 
and we need to slow down evangelism. And that's why we love the story of hope because we feel like it helps people understand what, who God is and who Jesus is and who we are and helping them understand these truths over time. And um, I am no super evangelist, but I love, I love to build with people. I'm not like the guy who can walk in the room and instantly turn the conversation to spiritual things. But I do love to build with people. And, and I want to be a part of that. So believers in Jesus Christ ought to actively participate in fulfilling the Great Commission. Why? Kind of going back through those points. To submit to the authority of Christ, to experience the purpose of Christ, and to promote the worship of God. How can we do this? By praying, building, and teaching. So if I authorized you, going back to my opening illustration, if I authorized you to build my shed, the shed of our dreams, your task would be to do that. Well, Jesus has authorized Little Fork Baptist Church and you as individual believers to be about the Great Commission. Let's do what Jesus has asked us to do. Have every head bowed and eyes closed and just want to thank the Lord for our time together. Father God, I thank you that we have this word from you. Thank you, God, that in your sovereign plan, you have allowed us to have what you have wanted us to know. To know about you, to know about us, to know about Jesus, and to know about why you have placed us on this earth. To know you and to help others to get to know you. And so, Jesus, we thank you for the great commission you gave to those 11, and even in the, in the other passages in which you shared with your disciples. And I ask that you would help us, that you would help Little Fork Baptist Church to be about your great commission and that individually that we would all be about the great commission. And Lord, that we would be talking to you about people and asking you to open up opportunities, that we would be building with the people that you have placed in our life and in our circle, and that we would teach over time and be uh, apprentices and helping people to know Christ and to follow Christ and in turn to help others to know and follow Christ. And so God, we thank you for this time. Thank you for your love for us and pray that you'd use us for your sake. In Jesus' name, amen.